Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Festival of Place the Pineapples in association with the Design Council. This is a unique event where we bring together developers, designers, and placemakers from across the built environment to share they work, their work as they vie to win a golden pineapple for place. We want to celebrate the best in practice to shine a light on those delivering the changes we would like to see. My name is Christine Murray. I'm the director and co-founder of the Festival of Place and editor-in-chief of The Developer. We're a small independent media company that focuses on how to develop and support livable places where citizens thrive. This morning, we'll be hearing from the shortlist for the Pineapple for Creative Reuse, which seeks to recognize projects that celebrate retention and re-adoption over demolition and discard. This afternoon, we've got the Pineapples for Sustainable Transport and Active Travel Initiatives. And we have a great lunchtime talk today as well with Mehek Agraval on creating the right policy to support sustainable urban design and, uh, and actually to create more climate resilient places. So we have um, just 10, each team is going to have just 10 minutes to present. Our judges will then have 10 minutes to ask questions and you'll be meeting the judges after our first presentation today, but I'm gonna take a moment to introduce them now. Uh, with me today is Elizabeth Peckett, Head of Asset Management at Allied London, who takes responsibility for asset strategy across the company's portfolio, including at Spin Spitting Fields and Leeds Dock. We've got Justin Nichols, founding partner of Fathom Architects, who's worked uh, previously and in his current practice has been involved in varied projects from Beijing International Airport to Grosvenor Waterside and the Crown Estates St. James Market. And we have Blossom Young, head of operations at Poplar Harka, where she leads social, economic and cultural regeneration strategies and projects in East London. So um, you probably, some of you have discovered the emojis uh, already, but if you could show some appreciation from our judges, there they are, and uh, and wish everybody good luck today. And if you want to say hello to each other or comment, we have the chat over on the right hand side. So do um, pop your notes and say hello to each other there. So um, without further ado, it's time to hear from our first shortlisted project today, and that is the Hatworks Creative Workspace in Luton. Um, so please welcome to the uh, stage, M Marie Kirksch. Uh, Kirk, Kirk, uh, Kirby Shaw, sorry, Marie, Marie Kirby Shaw and Richard Henson. Good morning. I'm just waiting for Richard to upload the slides. No, no problem. I will stay with you until you're all shared and then I guess we'll start the clock on your 10 minutes. Beautiful, that looks great. Good luck. Okay. Um, our project's called the Hat District Creative Cluster, which builds on Luton's rich manufacturing and making heritage. Richard, do you want to move the slide on, please? During the 1800s, Luton grew from a small market town into a large industrial centre that traded globally. The driving force behind this change was the hat industry, which was set up around the plentiful raw material of straw. This map shows the hundreds of hat factories and related traders in pink, once prominent across the landscape, but sadly only a handful of factories operate today as seen in dark blue. In 2017, the Culture Trust charity took the opportunity to breathe new life into some of the more prominent in the Plattersley Conservation Area. The Hat District Creative Cluster, which Richard's about to show you, um, consists of four buildings, Hat House, Hat Works, the Hat Factory Arts Centre and Hat Studios. It's located in the main pedestrian route between L Luton Station and the town centre. And given the proximity to Luton Airport and Mainland Station with trains to London in 22 minutes, the Hat District is arguably the best located creative cluster in the UK. Following successful fundraising of £10 million since 2017, we've adapted three former hat factories into over 20,000 20, square feet of new creative workspace. We grow talent in partnership with formal education providers, including our neighbouring University of Bedfordshire Art and Design School. We also actively engage young people in creative career possibilities through our extensive schools programme. The Hat District Ecology is designed to feed itself through Skillshare, mentoring, job opportunities and inspiration, as well as financially. 
The cost neutral model uses the rent and higher incomes, cafe, bar and ticket sales to invest back into cultural activity, young people, the buildings, operations and future growth. As a charity, we uphold the value that affordability should not be a barrier to engagement. And at Hatworks, we provide free, subsidised and funded startup opportunities for creative entrepreneurs. By the 1930s, Luton produced up to 70 million hats a year. But with global trade and changes in fashion, Luton's hat production has declined. Hatworks was the last remaining hat factory in the town centre. But sadly, Morris Davis closed his doors in 2006 and is pictured here packing his last hat. The building remained empty until we bought it in 2017. And in that time, it had fallen into disrepair with toxic mould, water ingress, wet and dry rot, vermin, vandalism and arson. We set to work applying for grants to save the building from further deterioration. Despite Luton often being described as a northern town in the south, We've not benefited from post-industrial transformation. To one table one, how do I? Regeneration initiatives and millennium funding received by counterparts in the north. Only now has this area been given a chance with 3.9 million pounds from the local growth fund awarded to the Hat District at the start of the project. The Grade Two listed Hat Works was built in the early 1800s. Hat Works is no stranger to creative reuse. It was originally a grand dwelling built between the banks of the River Lee and the railway, but by the turn of the 1900s and with rapid industrialisation, Hatworks was adopted firstly as a straw plat warehouse, and then it was a factory by Durler's Hat Company who made straw hats. And now it's been transformed into a creative workspace. Adjacent to Hatworks is the Hat Factory Arts Centre, which was built in 1927 and is the largest and most established building in the cluster. Having operated as an art centre since 1998, the Hat Factory hosts live music, comedy, dance, film and theatre and after a £2 million redevelopment was relaunched with a spectacular festival in September 29 pictured here top left, where thousands of local users were welcomed back. Hat House, seen here through the window of Hat Works, was used for a variety of purposes since closing as a Hat Factory, including periods as a snooker club, restaurant, church, dance studio and gym. Hat House and Hat Works have been modified over the years with rooms being subdivided and windows being blocked up. This resulted in inaccessible, dark and illegible spaces. Through our project, we've opened up and revealed the raw and honest functionality of the building to make inspiring workspaces that meet market need. Over the last four years, the Hatworks building has been carefully redesigned to provide a range of shared open workspaces spreading over three floors with generous and inspiring communal areas. Here, members can develop ideas, collaborate and benefit from affordable and professional workspace with like-minded others. Progression is key. First, members start on the ground floor pictured here in a shared mixed use space. And then as their creative businesses progress, they move to the first floor hot desk workshops and then to the top floor for a more dedicated and personalized business environment. From the top floor, members can then move to next level individual spaces at Hat Studios and Hat Factory. As their clients, contracts and confidence grows, they may then be able to commit to longer term leases at Hat House paying commercial rent. Thus, investing financially back into the ecology and enabling us as a not-for-profit to provide subsidies and support. As a Grade 2 list building, the curatorial and design team has studied and interpreted the original architecture and found features, including a domestic fireplace, panelling, a well, and 19th century wallpaper, along with many salvaged items such as a Singer sewing machine, hats found under the floorboards and a clocking in machine. The new stairwell pictured here provides a nod to the former factory use with ghost doors to the adjoining building, historic graffiti, burnt brick and raw industrial scars on the walls. A new lantern caps the stairs allowing natural light to flood the floors below. The ethos of the Hat District is to provide the conditions within which a vibrant creative community can grow. Hat Works is for startup for early stage entrepreneurs needing affordable shared space. Hat Factory and Hat Studios is for setup for those who've started up their business but need their own individual space. Hat House is for stand up for those having established their business and are growing to require larger space. 
Hat Studios is the build is the next building for the trust to develop along the same road as Hat Works and Hat House, and will provide a further eight thousand square feet of retail studio and workspace. Importantly, as a charity, we now own the freehold of Hat Works, Hat House, and Hat Studios. This, we believe, will enable us as custodians to safeguard and secure the tenure for creatives long into the future. With our innovative model, we will ensure that creative entrepreneurs are not priced out of their workplaces in the Hat District as the area grows in popularity, property values increase, and gap sites are filled with new developments. The Hat District is making an important cultural, social and economic contribution to the local area through jobs, high street animation, business startups, creative retail, commissions, arts programmes, exhibitions and public art. One of the first interventions we made in stating our intent to transform the area was to commission local artist and Turner Prize nominee Mark Titchener in 2016 to create a work for the Gable End of the Hat Factory. Lighting up like a beacon, of hope it reads if you can dream it you must do it we then invited mark to collaborate with another luton lads turn good typographer jonathan barnbrook with the promise seen here on the right with an exceptional and collective spirit we wholeheartedly believe that we are playing our part in dreaming big and then making it happen punching above our weight possibly but through the hat district it's evident that luton is beginning to brim with pride once more thank you Lovely story. I really liked what you said about dreaming big and about the building like a beacon, lighting up like a beacon. Um, I'm going to invite our judges now to turn on their um, cameras. And actually, Justin, I was going to bring you in first. Would you like to share your um, thoughts and insights? Um, yes, um, I, I came up. Uh, so thank you very much, Richard, for showing us around uh, last week. Um, I thought it was a really fascinating kind of ecology um, of buildings you have and businesses and arts, arts and cultures. Um, one question for you really is, what do you think the benefits are of working within existing buildings? And as Christine allowed us to have a two-part question, do you think um, from both the development perspective and uh, what you're delivering at the end, is that easier or harder than working in a new, if you were doing a new building? I think I'll just start briefly and then hand over to Richard. Um, it's definitely harder. It's harder because um, the buildings um, needed to be stripped back with great deal of care, particularly the listed ones. Um, and then they needed to be redesigned. And we were very careful about retaining the integrity of the architectural features um, in order to um, promote the heritage. But in actual fact, that made some of the design solutions more costly and certainly more complex, which um, Richard and I have many conversations about. Richard, do you want to add to that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, reuse of buildings is, you know, sustainability uh, level one, isn't it? You're not pulling down something which already exists. And more than that, you're not pulling down the history of the um, town. I mean, I think Luton is quite a stratified town. As you walk from the station, you pass through the historic hat district you come to the uh the clearance of the 1970s shopping mall and then you're back to the kind of uh, art deco high street with its grand town hall you know so so you can really tell the story of a of a town and the place through its buildings and to just to kind of uh you know tabula rasa them down kind of you lose all that all, all those all those stories i mean hat works is interesting in that it's the oldest hat factory in Luton and it really tells a story of the stepping stones through to the industrialization because it was originally a house it's very domestic in scale all the other hat factories are very kind of prominent tall typologies and um, they kind of almost act as gateposts into Luton from the station you understand the kind of history and the uh, the story of the town just through its architecture so I think you know to start afresh you lose a lot of that and i think um people respond to being able to interact touch and uh be part of that story and if i can just add um because it's in a conservation area these buildings didn't have future use and future plans and so they were left empty and that was the saddest recollection of the local people about the decline of the industry so although 
the preservation um, plans were required in order to protect the, the heritage and the histories of the area, it's actually reanimating an old building for use of local young people sends a really positive story and it connects new communities, particularly in Luton, which is a plural town. It's about new communities that are coming to Luton that feel that that building is theirs. So we're reconnecting people with the heritage of the building by changing its use. Thank you. Uh, Lawson, I know that you, the Poplar Harker, have been involved in, in kind of workspaces, creative workspaces, but uh, over to you for your comment. Uh, sure, thanks so much for a, a great presentation and a really interesting model, I think, around cross-subsidy that, that lots of us can, can learn from, I think. Um, I, I'm really interested in the interplay between, it's, it's really obvious you've got a great business ecosystem going and you talked about engagement with schools but I, I wondered about that that interaction with the wider community beyond the heritage um, and, and kind of that accessibility into creative careers and I guess associated with that the, the diversity of businesses that you have within the industry so you talked a lot about making and a lot about the, the heritage of, of hat making and, and whether that was reflected in the types of businesses that you have in the space. It's really important because as a local charity to serve our viewers and to ensure that our offer is locally relevant but also nationally important. So thank you for recognising the innovative model. Um, we started by developing um, a programme called The Pioneers where we invited particularly young creative people with ideas from Luton to come and work with us on the project and, um, and they worked on, with the design teams um, with, with Richard and Fleets and others on, on saying what they wanted from their buildings. So whilst it's design and heritage led, it's also been very much led by the, the, the future users um, who have brought their own stories and ideas. And they're also as part of the project, um, project ambassadors. So they are also telling the story within the community, the wider community about what we're doing all the way along the three, four years it's taken us um, through to our launch and our opening. So we're connecting through a network of pioneer ambassadors. I mean, I think it's also worth saying with um, the Hat House, where you have more um, kind of longer tenancies for more established companies, we've actually uh, very gratifyingly been able to re reintroduce hat making to the centre of Luton because the Panama Hat company now uh, occupies the ground floor is, of the building is making hats once again so that's that's a nice story as well Elizabeth I'd love to bring you to the stage to share your thoughts absolutely thank you very much it was a fascinating presentation on the history and where you've got to today but I just wondered have you come across any challenges that have made you think about the future evolution of the place, things that you might need to adapt and how the strategy is going to you know, move forward from here? I, I think um, already we're seeing demand is very high. We've got waiting lists for Hat Factory um, and Hat House. We've only got a couple of spaces left there. And the order in which we did the buildings was probably not the right order, right? because Hat Works is the entry point, that's where people start up. And so um, and, until we've actually got all of the ecology there, we've got a couple of blockages. Um, we've got high interest in Hat Works, but it will take time for people to work through the layers, as I explained. And then that gives us a bit of time to build Hat Studios, which is the next space. Because at the moment, if we fill Hat, Studio, Hat Works, We've got nowhere for them to go. There's no next level space. So Hat Studios is critical to the ecology. Thank you. We have time for one more follow-up question if anyone would like to come back on some of the things they've said. If not, I would just like to ask, um, what have you, um, how has, do you think, how have you built in that future flexibility within the building itself? You mentioned that you're kind of adding space, but is there more to be done on this existing structure? And have you been able to, to observe some changes of usage through COVID? And are there things you're already thinking about that you would like to do? 
Richard, do you want to talk about the architectural? Uh, well, I think um, I think we're, given that it's such a densely uh, populated kind of area, what would the, I mean, it, it really is the um, tall streets and kind of full backlands, if you like, of all sorts of things going on around the backs of the buildings. There's not really that much opportunity to kind of uh, extend or expand um, the existing buildings due to conservation area listings etc um i think uh there are gap sites around and we have we've uh, been able to identify one in hat studios but as the um as for the existing buildings there isn't that much opportunity to actually make them bigger um that said i think in hat house there has been um people have been able to adapt the spaces that we have uh, offered in that they're um they uh they were kind of category cat, cat a, uh, uh, spaces so they were able, they they they've been able to adapt and make their own um but beyond that no i think there's uh it, it's more looking look, looking for new sites rather than kind of going outwards or upwards i think that covid's been a a, a sad um, opportunity mm. um and we've been approached by local businesses neighbors and buildings in the area to see us because we're a charity whether we would like to buy the buildings from them because they can't use them for their current use anymore. And I do think that probably is going to be the next iteration for the trust to be able to work in partnership with local companies to help them, to help them and, and perhaps subsidize some of their entrepreneurial creative ideas um, for us to take some of the management of the building and some of the responsibilities. So that's something that has emerged during COVID, which my board and I are looking at the potential to take forward um, because we see ourselves as curators of the whole of the Hat District and whole of the conservation area, not just the four buildings that we have. So I think a wider remit for our work, it, it, there is potential for us to work in that way for expansion. I know Justin wants to come in, back in now, so I'm going to uh, hand to you, Justin, for a super quick answer and a succinct, sorry, succinct question and a succinct. Yes, uh, just a quick one. I, I like the shot you had of the event you had outside um, and the two murals, I think, work really well as a kind of entry uh, route into the town. Have you got any ambitions or uh, plans for more public realm interventions as you kind of grow? Yes. The whole idea is we spill out onto the streets to animate. So the Hat Factory has got a programme of spill out works. Um, in terms of public art, we are going to be commissioning more works. Um, we didn't show you a picture, but on the back of Hat House, we commissioned an artist to produce a large scale hat pin, which cuts so one small off. picture. One small picture. Yeah. So we'd like to commission more artists to produce hat pins to cut through the buildings. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of response to your question and also to the previous one. In, in, in many ways, this, although it may look like this isn't Shoreditch, this is Luton. And I think um, that's something to remember that the level of public art and uh, and the kind of uh, that, what that gives back to the street is really great. I mean, and that, that if you can dream it, you must do it. it. It's the first thing you see as you get off the train station as you're walking into Luton. And I think that's a really great message. Well, that just leaves me to thank you both for your presentation. And uh, this concludes uh, your 10, your 20 minute slot. So um, it's, um, I'm going to send you back into the uh, uh, column here and I'm going to introduce our next project. I'm really pleased to welcome Alex Wilson from Copeland, uh, who's going to be talking to us about Copeland Park and the Bussy Building. Welcome, welcome Alex. Oh, you're on mute. Hang on. There we go. Good morning. How is everybody? The standard Zoom entry to 2020 there. I hope everyone's keeping well and everyone can hear me. We're perfectly. You're coming in perfectly well. Wonderful. Should I set the presentation up? Yes, go ahead. I'll stay with you until you're all set to go. <coughs> okay, hopefully you can see that. It looks great. I'm going to let the clock run.
Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm, as, as introduced, I'm Alex Wilson. My background actually is as a chartered surveyor and chartered town planner. Um, as a bit of background um, here at the Copen Park and Brussels Building Estate, my family's been involved in this space since the mid 1990s. Now, it's a mixed multi use creative space based in Peckham, London, um, and it's a mix of creative arts, retail, and leisure with a really strong push towards the creative arts sector. Um, all, I should add that all of the businesses that are on the estate are um, small or start-up and growing independent businesses. So there's none of the usual uh, high street chains that you'd often see um, because we personally favour small starting businesses because all of those large businesses have to start somewhere. And one of the sort of reasons for that is also it allows for organic and involving development. Now, um, just to give you a bit of background about the estate, it's actually a one hectare site um, uh, across it, based in Peckham, and um, with uh, five-storey building um, back from the 1880s, which if I just move on, you can actually see some of the before and afters, as it were. So um, the photo in the top uh, left is actually from circa 2013, and the one at the bottom, the, the landscape at the bottom, is actually from uh, well. About two years ago, you can tell because no one's wearing masks. But the Bussy building, which is the last building that you can see in front of you, um, actually started life as a textiles and leather goods and sporting goods manufactory for George Bussy, making tennis rackets, cricket bats, and then in the First World War, uh, leather goods for the armaments as well. So it's got a very much evolving and continuously changing uh, history. But one of the useful things is that's enabled us to then go, OK, we're going to really push this into the creative arts art sector. To the um, west of the estate, uh, fronting Rye Lane, we've got uh, what was Holdren's department store, which was a large department store constructed in the 1930s. And that um, then had a checkered life. It's been a blockbuster video store at one stage and is currently home to Khan's Emporium, which has um, world goods from across the globe. So if I focus on some of the things that we've really tried to concentrate on over the years here, and that's been um, partly the economic focus, as we understand that small businesses are going to be the backbone of the, the, both the local regeneration and obviously the wider economic situation across the country. Um, it's a site with, we reckon, uh, from our pre, again, perhaps pre-COVID estimates, of around 700 full-time equivalent jobs across 127,000 square foot of letable space. Um, it's a lot of actually uh, a lot of our work isn't just as as it were traditional landlords. It's also assisting businesses with um, how should I describe it? How to how to run a small business? So little, little tidbits like keeping your receipts. Um, we often try to promote short term hires as this gives the opportunity for small galleries and markets and such to really start to get their first foothold to then see if they can get onto something. And so one nice little story we've got actually from uh, about 2015 was we had one of our very first food markets. There were only six uh, food stalls that came along and that was in 2015. And again, pre-pandemic stats here, um, by, by sort of 2019, all six of those had opened a restaurant in and around Peckham. And so it's very much sort of that first foothold on the business ladder to start growing. Um, a lot of it does require attention to detail. Um, obviously, artist studios, of which we've got 75 currently, um, we're currently going through a process of renovating. And one of the little sort of things that we've realized is there's little details, which is um, on some of them that we did, we just changed the doors to the you know, main front door to the, the studios you normally would. And actually, it was only after that we realized, actually, if you put in the sort of, uh, so they're, they're mobility access doors, but they're actually essentially a door with a quarter panel. On the rebuild cost, it costs probably an extra 100 or so pounds in terms of materials and labor, but it certainly makes it much easier for the uh, final tenant, the user of that space, to get in and out with any bulky goods they may have, or even just with moving in and out. And it's that sort of flexibility, such as also, say, having fiber to the premises, so they've got fast, reliable internet, mixed with, say, having an artist sink, you know, with those deep basins, so that actually we can have a space that either enables um, a high-tech startup to function on photography or videographer, but equally, as it were, a traditional painting artist. And so it's that sort of mixture between those two that has perhaps enabled us to keep that flexibility, keep that evolution, and allow these businesses to continue to grow. 
Um, as mentioned there, that also sadly means allowing for failure, which isn't perhaps something we always like to talk about, but it's something you've certainly got to acknowledge, namely, a lot of these small businesses, some of them, for whatever reason, often no fault of their own, aren't perhaps going to work. And so it's not tying them into onerous terms. And if we can see someone that is struggling and isn't able to cope and wants to leave, then we'll often let that happen because that's better for everyone. There's no point in holding people to things that aren't working. Um, one of the other key functions that we're aware of is that um, we are part of the community. And there is both a community in and around the estate, uh, across the 150 circa tenancies, tenants, which probably have upwards of 300 independent small businesses on site, but equally, of course, within the wider confines of Peckham and obviously London. And so we try to do lots of different variety of things because we know it's variety is one of the things which will continuously attract people to the space, make it, make it what it is, and bring that vibrancy, which actually all the creative arts thrive on. So we've got everything from sort of yoga that happens on the roof to sort of music events. And one of the things we often, well, again, apart from last year for obvious reasons, we have our Peckham Festival, which we actually founded. And that has up to 30,000 people across three days, um, 100 plus artists and musicians doing their thing. Um, and we founded this partly as a way to give back, but also to highlight the artists in their artist studios, essentially through a an enlarged open studios program. Um, we've also made sure that we, as it were, give back um, in, in ways we can to, to support um, small and minority group artists. So we, um, we've we given, say, four weeks free rental space to South Asian Heritage and Black History Month, as well as um, a number of other different, different organisations, such as the Every Woman one, which actually just finished uh, a week or so ago now. Now, I've mentioned arts a lot, but there's more because it is about the cultural focus um, and making sure that we, we have culture is very much part of it. Um, you've got to have places to work, live and play. And we try to make sure that um, uh, here we achieve all three of those things from small businesses to, to arts and events. So obviously we've got the art, nighttime economy events, which are perhaps quite well known in the local area, bars, restaurants and nightclubs, as well as the rooftop cinema and film club which obviously has the bar as well, which again, um, when the weather is good, um, it is very pleasing to be able to see the London Vista, Vista from the top there. But we've also done perhaps more eclectic things such as um, the Great Master Ball, um, but also we try to make sure there's plenty of food festivals because uh, that's, that's a way of, again, giving small, small caterers the opportunity to get that footfall to then start up to go for further. Um, We've uh, also done various, supported other projects such as Dance for Refuge um, and uh, Black Pound Day Market. Again, just to highlight these, these smaller community groups which need the assistance where they can uh, to then grow further. Um, now, I have mentioned it a number of times and unfortunately it's, it is very much the sort of elephant in the room and that's obviously COVID-19. I just wanted to address briefly how we've adjusted and uh, offered opportunities to that. One of the first things we had to do was dip into our own reserves to do some rent deferment for across the, the tenants. Um, and we've also done, again, as I mentioned, assisting small businesses with their, uh, as it were, business administration where we can, with grant applications for businesses. If people remember the very first um, lockdown, the business rate grant, so it's making sure that our tenants were able to access that in the best way possible. We, um, one of the, as it were, nice stories from the pandemic, um, if there can be such a thing. Uh, a company that was saying they could produce hand sanitizer were looking for some space and so without batting an eyelid we gave them some vacant space and gave them um, basically a, a good couple of months free space so that they could produce hand sanitizer and they've actually now pivoted to actually doing uh, clothing sales as well. So they've essentially now become an established tenant. Now one of the sad things is that some of our large event spaces that do enable us to have this variety may potentially have to become longer term tendencies, but I think that's because of the uh, inevitable uh, offshoots from COVID, unfortunately. Now I just want to cover, um, as it were, the future. Where, where do we go from here? Now we're quite, quite aware that we are in fact, of course, just the custodians of this area. Any, any of us are living on this land, so we've got to take good care of it. And that doesn't just mean from an environmental perspective, such as uh, re uh, building a recycling and waste facility, which would see separation of different waste and therefore better uh, re 
recycling targets, but also reducing vehicle movements. One of the big projects that I've personally been involved in recently has actually been a rooftop development with the assistance of Montague Evans and Kennedy Wood Architects, um, amongst others, to see uh, the roof of the Bussey building actually have a sort of closing roof in the same way that Wimbledon would, so allow a year-round weatherproof facility. Now, one of the other things that we're constantly doing, and I think we've got one floor left to do, is the studio renovations, which we're achieving and getting close to finishing now. And as mentioned earlier, we do, we do lots of things to make sure that uh, they can be truly flexible workspaces so that any, essentially any small business can go in there and just hit the ground running, because that's what they need. The final thing that I just want to touch on before I take any questions is actually Holdren's Arcade, which um, is actually part of the old department store. And we're now seeing, um, we've done some heritage restoration of the thing, uh, peeling back the old surfaces to find the old heritage elements. Again, that's independent startup retail units at very affordable rent for a relatively small space, but it, it gets them a high street presence and from there they can grow. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much. Um, to the Festival of Place for this opportunity, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thanks so much. It's so interesting to hear about the kind of changing, um, uh, the changes that you're thinking about doing to COVID in that immediate response, as well as looking at the larger uh, reuse of the space. So, um, Elizabeth, would you like to come in first this time and maybe um, uh, ask Alex a little bit more about his work? Absolutely, yes. And um, as you know, Alex, I was a Peckham resident for a number of years, so I spent many hours in your area and the surrounding areas. Um, so my question is kind of related to that. So given that some of the uses are nighttime activities and people are around there um, until the early hours of the morning, how what's the management of the site and do you have someone available 24 7 for safety security reasons absolutely and, and obviously without going into um all the fun and games you must have had uh, throughout the wee hours um i actually again this, this sort of harks back to the sort of town planning perspective that i've got i realized quite early on that what we essentially have here was a site that was operational about 23 hours of the day so we're almost getting close to sort of hospital airport levels of how do you manage this space? How, how do you accommodate the fact that cleaners have to come in and do their thing at a certain point, and yet you've still got people doing other things? And so um, I, I, this is, it almost sounds like boring property management and any involved in the property industry will understand it, but it, it is, that's where the service charge and making sure that we do have 24 hour security as well as CCTV. Um, and that's just baked into the uh, setup. And, and that does mean in one sense that some tenants essentially, because it is essentially, if you're a nighttime user, you pay a bit more and you get some security. They still have to provide their own security for their actual premises, but we provide as it were ground securities and they work quite well together um, because we do understand that it's, it is about safety um, for everybody staff, customers, tenants, etc. And it's allowing that to happen. So it's just those, uh, to go back to the old Jane Jacobs, eyes on the streets. If you've got lots of people around, it's actually relatively safe. And again, with a 23 plus operational hour site, there's always somebody there from, who's a member of the public that's actually just doing something there. And so by doing that, things were able to be seen and, and hopefully it prevented should they happen. Fantastic, thank you. Blossom, would you like to come in now? And <coughs> um, sure, uh, Alex. Thanks so much for your presentation and for for welcoming me to Peckham uh, the other week. It was uh, really you. inspiring to see your site and just the vast, uh, real, real breadth of of activities um, going on. And I and I guess um, so much of what you're doing is is influencing uh, influencing Peckham and influencing wider London. And I wondered if you could talk to kind of how Copeland and Bussy, how you see it sitting within the wider landscape and within the wider cultural programme and maybe partners that you're working with to see to realize things. Yeah, so that's actually a good question. We are, without sounding like the, the only fools and horses, uh, New York, Tokyo, London, Peckham, 
Um, but it does sometimes feel as though we're, we're seen as a bit of a hallmark in this area. We sometimes mm -hmm. build ourselves as Peckham's cultural quarter. And uh, I certainly remember before uh, the Mount View uh, Dance and Drama School came to Peckham, the local uh, London Borough of Southwark certainly put us on the tour, as it were, to show them why they should come. And it was, it, we were, I, I, I'm, I'm not the sort of person who likes to sort of promote myself overtly, um, but essentially we were part of the reason that they were saying, well, hang on, there's all this other dance and drama, you know, art that is going on right here, and it is now a couple hundred meters away from where they're based. Um, and it's, it's allowing for that because one of the things we've seen time and again in sort of regenerative cycle across the Western world is that actually art often ends up being the impetus and start that then leads to other things. Um, I've often joked that's because artists will happily tolerate messy, dirty work environments, whereas others want something slightly cleaner, and that's fine. But you know what? They get going and they just do something. And then that leads to people going, oh, what's that over there? Let's go and have a look. And that's that attraction. So we've certainly seen other buildings and sites in and around the area essentially come and either copy our model, I don't want to say copy our model, but um, uh, take inspiration from our model um, or attract themselves because of this. And so obviously that's all bringing investment and jobs um, to, to the area and, and not just as it were, low level retail jobs, but actually higher skilled ones or ones that enable people to, as it were, climb that skill ladder. Thank you. Justin. Hi, Alex. Um, thank you much for the presentation um, and uh, the tour last week. I think what's really interesting about this project is um, you have a piece of infrastructure such as London Overground um, uh, arriving and the way you're able to take that and uh, create an opportunity out of that. Um, and it's also really lovely uh, to see a family run business uh, evolving. And that's you know very unusual um, these days. From a property perspective, um, I think we in the kind of construction side of that, if you wish, tend to kind of overthink how we start something. And what I really loved about the development overall is like, what's the minimum you can do to get something going and test it? And then you go, OK, well, we'll come back to that in a year, two years time and we'll make it better rather than what we do is we sit there and we try and think of what the end game is in five to ten years time which means you've got to put a lot of capital in and a lot of risk. So I think as a development model, it's a very interesting proposition. Question, um, what, were, what were some of the key challenges uh, to the project, particularly to kind of get you off the ground in the beginning? Um, well, actually, it's interesting you mentioned, as it were, the, the sort of traditional approach. Um, it'd be only actually just to focus on that for a second. I'd say almost what we had was almost quite an uh, engineering conservative model, which was actually make a small change, see what happens, adjust. Make another small change, see what happens, adjust. And you're not going to see instant results because we're, we're allowing things to happen and things take time. Now, to come to your direct question, I'll say there's actually, there were two particular challenges and there were two ways that we overcame it. Um, uh, so the first one actually was we, when we sort of really sort of got the bit by the, the chop, chomp by the bit, as it were, to go, right, we are going to do this, we're going to really turn this into an arts uh, creative space. And as you mentioned, obviously the overground really opened that up. The artist studios have been here since the mid nineties already, but they really got, ironically, put on the map by TFL when the overground arrived. It was already there, the connections were already there as well. They just weren't highlighted in quite the same way. So it was that highlighting which helped but equally any vacant space we had, essentially what we did was go really generous terms to the prospective tenants. Essentially, this is yours, you get four or five months free rent, but it's in a rundown condition, but you need to do it up to this specification. And again, the good thing with the tenants we're working with that because a lot of them do come from the arts and creative background, they're actually quite used to getting a paintbrush in their hand and dealing with it. Whereas again, obviously, if you've got a perhaps more traditional uh, tenant, the, they would no, no. I want to walk in. I want everything whitewashed already. Why is it? Why? Why don't? Why do I have to do this? And we're saying, well, you're getting it for peanuts for the first few months. Um, the other thing that we've had is actually dealing with um, other large bodies, um, local authorities, banks, institutions, that sort of thing, to actually get them around to this sort of model because they're expecting the. Well, hang on. When are you going to just turn it into a four, three to four hundred flats? 
And the answer is, well, no, we, we quite like the idea we've got a load of jobs on site here. Um, and, and sort of it's that mindset change of going, well, we, you've got to have jobs somewhere. There's a reason why people live where they do. And it's often because that's where their employment is. And if you don't, it's, you've got to have employment led because otherwise you're not going to have people there. So in terms of the challenge to overcome it, it's actually adjusting on each individual basis to have flexible terms where possible. And also that time it takes to explain to, to other institutions how this actually works, what is the thing, and then fundamentally saying, but look what we've actually done. You know, don't listen to what we say, look at what we've actually done. And actually, obviously, this is now much easier now, a few years down the line, because we can point to 75 artist studios and probably in that time, I, I almost want, I'd have to guess, but obviously we've had a lot of artists that have changed and then they've gone on to bigger spaces. So, you know, we've, we've had the classic, you know, someone literally started with one artist studio, doubled that up to us, uh, the one next door as well. And then before they know it, they were taking a larger independent space and now they've just moved again to an even bigger space. And at some point, they are literally going to outgrow us. And that's a really nice problem to have. So Alex, I wanted to ask you a bit about that um, that process of uh, the artist maybe you know getting the, the low rent to kind of help fix it up and then going on to use it. I mean, a lot of these artist spaces are, are talk about how the rents go up and up and up as the as the place becomes more desirable. Do you have an ambition to keep it affordable? Is that a concern of yours as it becomes in demand or perhaps the spaces get nicer? Or what's your approach it's to ideas around gentrification and rent? Well, I, 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 without getting into an argument, I don't. Like, I never like the word gentrification. Um, because one of the points I often remind people, I imagine remind the judges when they came on the site tour, is uh, I've, I've yet to find the actual copy, but I believe it was the 19, one of the 1908 versions of the Estates Gazette had Peckham Rye Lane as the second most expensive retail space in the world. Now, it's not gentrification if we're going back there. Now, I don't think we'll quite get there, but uh, the concept is land always changes. Peckham is where it is. It is, you know, put a good pair of shoes on, you're 30 minutes to walk to the city of London. It is where it is. Um, in terms of artists being priced out, well, in a way, we started to see this. Uh, several years ago, we had a lot of sculptors on site. Sculptors, by their very nature, require much larger working spaces, often on the ground floor and therefore often at a premium for that sort of thing. Um, and they've just been priced out. And that's, we don't want that. We try to have some sculptors still here, but essentially we are subsidizing them. And that's the only way it works. But we also understand that without using the subsidy word too much, but by giving them much more better terms, there are other tenants that want to be associated and nearby them. And so you've got this tenant mix. And by having both, then essentially the ones that are paying higher are, are subsidizing the lower paid ones. You can't just, you know, if, if we just had uh, lots of photographers or magazines or that sort of thing, which are often sort of sat in desks and you can fit, you know, four, four to six people in an artist studio if they're just on desks. That's still creative arts, but it's not necessarily the same thing. But you do need that, that flexibility, or not, sorry, not flexibility, that variety in order for people to actually want to be here. Um, it's, it's, to go to the old adage, it's often, you remember, you'd walk down the high street when we were allowed to do such things, and you would see all the mobile phone shops next door to one another, or all the old travel agents back when they existed. And there's a reason they like to cluster, and arts are obviously the similar. But you've got to have that variety at the same time. Well, we just have two minutes left, so I'm just going to check, do the judges have any further questions? Just to put your, yeah. And Justin would like to come um, back or? Very, very quick sum, summing up question. Um, you showed a photo of uh, the yard about five or six years ago and one today. What will it look like in five years time? Oh, <laughs> um, I'd have to get this roof development done. Um, if I'm honest, COVID torpedoed that along with obviously lots of other things. But uh, so it essentially adding an additional floor on top of the busy building so that you've got that weatherproof year round, but you've still got this view, you've still got the events and art space up there. <clears throat> I can't really see a sort of in five years, a uh, massive wholesale change. There will be more growth and development, some more density. Um, and the other area actually annoyingly just out of shot 
uh, that perhaps might see some more change in that time horizon actually would be actually the Rye Lane frontage because above uh, the department store there's actually a couple of floors of space which once they've been renovated and better access allowed you've got some space there to provide for perhaps food and beverage or uh, various other uses because obviously they're higher than ground floor they're not necessarily retail space but again we had that sort of in the pipeline provisioned certainly as a to do on the the old task list that never ends and uh, then 2019 well sorry 2019 came along and 2020 sure did and uh, that changed that so in terms of where we'd see five years it's that but certainly for the immediate term it's okay we've got we've got who we've got on site we're working with them to support them out of this recovery because it's only by all of us working together that actually we might be able to achieve that thank you thanks justin Great. Well, that's our time for this session. So thanks very much, Alex, for sharing that project with us today. And now we're going to go to a break, a comfort. Yes, the emoji applause. Thanks, everyone. We're going to go to a break. Feel free to join the table in the social lounge. Meet some of the others here as you grab a cuppa. And we will be back on the hour with Brixton Windmill and Roof East, um, as well as the record store at the Old Vinyl Factory. So three projects coming up at 11 o'clock. See you back in the